Hello! Mabuhay! This is Teacher Lourdes, and this is your course, Environmental Science. Our lesson 9 is Community Ecology. The objectives of these lessons are discuss and explain the following. Community ecology, habitat and niche, biodiversity, interrelationships among plants and animals, and ecological succession. And state what you have learned in this lesson. For this video, we will use videos from Momo Math and Science to discuss the following topics. Let us begin and watch the videos. A coral reef can provide a habitat for different forms of life. This diverse array of organisms each carve out its own niche. Welcome to Moomoo Math and Science and Habitat and Niche. A habitat is an ecological area where a plant or animal lives. It may be an island, a tree, or maybe even under a rock. This habitat is where an individual can find food, shelter, protection, or even mates. A niche is the role or position that an individual has in its environment. A niche may also involve what the individual eats, how it interacts with other living things, and also how it interacts with the non-living factors. Without ecological niches, there would be less diversity and the ecosystem would not be in balance. A quick example. I have taught at the same school and classroom for many years. This would be my habitat. I teach life science at this building and this is my niche. Miss English teaches English, and Mr. K teaches social studies. We all live in the same habitat, the school, but we all have our own little niche. Let's take a look at some real-world examples. I live in a deciduous forest. Plants and animals occupy the same areas. Some animals, like the woodpecker, and several other species of bats feed on insects. This helps to keep the insect population from growing out of control. Other animals, like a squirrel and chipmunk, could be considered spreaders. When they gather and store seeds and acorns and even berries, some get left behind, and some also get left behind after going poo. These seeds, like the blackberry bush, will grow into plants that provide food for other animals. The niches of plants and animals help keep their habitats healthy. Let's look at another example. The Galapagos Islands are islands located 605 miles to the west of South America. There are several different types of finches that live on the islands. Their habitat is the Galapagos Islands, and the different finches have their own niches. The different finches feed on different types of food. The warbler finch has a thin beak for eating insects. A ground finch has a short beak for eating seeds left on the ground. Cactus finches eat cacti seeds. Each finch has its own niche that allows them to survive and prosper in the same habitat as the other finches. Animals and plants all have very special roles to play in their communities, and the niches they fill help keep their habitat healthy. If you'd like to know more about habitat and niche, this playlist will help. And as always, thanks for watching. And Moo Moo Math uploads a new math and science video every day. Please subscribe and share. In 1988, Yellowstone National Park was on fire. Fires burned throughout the summer, destroying trees and vegetation. In the end, over 795,000 acres of land was burned. If you return to the same spot 10 years later, you could hardly tell the land had been burned. The variety of life found at Yellowstone allowed the ecosystem to recover and is an example of why biodiversity is important to an ecosystem. Biodiversity is the variety of life in an area that is determined by the number of species in that area. In simple terms, biodiversity is the number of different individuals and life forms in an area. As biodiversity increases, so does the health of the ecosystem increases. Think of it like this. You're running a business. You want your business to be healthy and make money. Imagine you sell shirts. However, you only sell a black shirt with a heart on it, so you're limited. If these shirts go out of style, you're out of business. If you have a variety of shirts, as fashion changes and tastes change, 
you're better able to adapt to these changes and continue making money. As biodiversity increases, the ecosystem has the ability to adapt to changes, and a healthy ecosystem has a greater chance of recovering from disasters. Biodiversity can be broken down into three types, genetic diversity, species diversity, and ecosystem diversity. Genetic diversity is the variety of genes which control inheritable characteristics present in a population. For example, the population of beetles have over 350,000 different varieties and are found in almost every environment, including freshwater, coastal habitats, wherever vegetation is found, in trees, in their bark, near flowers and leaves, and even underground near the roots. Also, think of the variety of dogs. You have different shapes and colors of dogs, and these are controlled by genes, and they either increase or decrease genetic diversity. Greater genetic diversity increases the odds of survival of a species or a population as the ecosystem changes. Species diversity. Species diversity is the number of different species and the relative abundance of each species in a community. A rainforest may have three to 50 million different types of species living in the forest. As species diversity increases, most likely the health of the ecosystem increases. Ecosystem diversity is the variation in the ecosystems found in a region or the variation in the ecosystems over the whole planet. It is a measure of the variety of biotic and living or living factors and non-living or abiotic factors present in an ecosystem. Rainforests usually have a high ecosystem diversity and deserts and polar regions usually have a low ecosystem diversity. In general terms, biodiversity is greater at the equator and decreases as you move away from the equator. So in summary, as the variety of life goes up in an ecosystem, biodiversity increases and the health of the ecosystem also goes up. Thanks for watching and Moo Moo Math uploads a new math and science video. In 1988, Yellowstone National Park Welcome, welcome, welcome to another lesson with Miss Matt. Now today we're going to look at the topic interrelationships of plants and animals. What does it mean by interrelationship of plants and animals? Interrelationship of plants and animals has to do with how plants and animals are related. They have similar characteristics. In order for plants to be pollinated, the pollination has to be done by other animals or animal pollinators such as bees. They produce food such as different kinds of fruits and all those different kinds of fruits are then consumed by animals, for example humans. Now we know that plants are producers, they produce the food and animals are the consumers. What the plants produce, the animals consume, such as us humans. Animals and plants, which are living things, require food. All living things require food. Plants of all living things makes their own food. Therefore, they are called autotrophs. Now, the reason they are called other food is because they are able to make their own food. Also, in the word other trope means self. And tropic means nourishment. Together, you get the word other So, that shows that plants of all living things are able to make their own food. They have that ability. They were given that ability to be able to make their own food. While plants are able to make their own food, right, because they are given that ability, animals are not able to make their own food, so therefore they are called heterotrophs. They have to seek food from other animals 
and plants whom are the producers for their food. Heather in the word hetero means other and trophic means nourishment. Now we're going to look at the three different types of animals, the three different types of feeders that exist in society. There are three different types and we have herbivores, carnivores and omnivores. So now we're going to look at each feeder. First one we have is herbivores animals which are herbivores now herbivores are herbivores animals they are plant eaters only they only consume plants for example we have the cow and we know that the cow consumes grass now we're looking at carnivorous animals which are known as carnivores there are two different kinds of carnivorous animals. You have the first set who eat other animals who only consume plants. Then you have the other animals whom they eat that only eat fleshy food. Now we're looking at omnivorous animals. Omnivorous animals are known as omnivores, which eat both plants and animals. So for example, as you can see the lady on the screen, she is a human and she consumes both plants and animals. So for example, we eat cabbage, a plant, and we also eat chicken or we eat fish, which is an animal. So omnivorous animals eat both plants and animals. Simple food chain showing the interrelationship of plants and animals. Now, what starts off the food chain? The food chain starts off with the leaf. What is the leaf? The leaf is known to be the producer. Who's the producer again? The producers are known to be plants because they are able to make their own food. Now the leaf there is the producer and it starts the food chain. Now who will consume the leaf? The leaf will be consumed by the caterpillar. Who is the caterpillar? The caterpillar is known to be the herbivorous animal or the herbivore. Who will consume the caterpillar? The caterpillar will be consumed by the chameleon. Who is the chameleon? The chameleon is known as carnivore. Now, this kind of carnivore only consumes other animals who only eat plants only. Then we have the snake. The snake will consume the chameleon. Now the snake also is a carnivore, but what kind of carnivore is the snake? The snake is a kind of carnivore who only eats fleshy meat. Then we have the mongoose and the mongoose will eat the snake and the mongoose is also a carnivore. So. The food chain basically shows the interrelationship between plants and animals. What eat what, who eat what. Our world is constantly changing. New islands are being created, fires burn in forests, Volcanoes explode and destroy areas. Nothing remains the same and habitats are constantly changing. Ecological succession is a process by which an ecological community undergoes changes following a disturbance or the initial colonization of a new habitat. 
For example, the islands of Hawaii were formed from volcanic activity. From their fiery start, over time they became tropical islands. There are two main types of succession, primary and secondary. Primary succession occurs in new areas that have little or no soil. In other words, the area has been almost completely destroyed or is newly formed. For example, new islands can be created from lava flows. The lava creates a new land without soil. A volcano may destroy a very large area. This would be an example of primary succession. Over time, dirt is formed, plants begin to grow, and a forest or a grassland may return. The first species that colonized this new land is called the pioneer species. Lichen and moss are many times pioneer species. Secondary succession occurs when an existing ecosystem has been destroyed or disturbed. They are more minor in magnitude compared to a primary succession. For example, a forest fire may destroy a large area of trees and plants, or flooding can destroy an area. In this before and after picture, the fire destroys plants, but the soil remains. Two years later, the forest has grown back. Here is how secondary succession may occur. Fire destroys plant growth. The fire leaves behind empty but not destroyed soil. Grasses and other plants grow back first. Small bushes and trees begin to colonize the area. Next, fast-growing evergreen trees develop to their fullest, while shade-tolerant trees develop underneath. Eventually, larger deciduous trees will grow over them, and the ecosystem is similar but different from where it began. These disturbances can actually be healthy for an area over time because they can lead to increased biodiversity. Controlled burns are practiced by many park services. The fires help manage weeds and other growth and helps to reduce the risk of wildfires, but it can also help destroy nutrients and lead to more desirable plant growth in the future. If you'd like to know more about succession, this playlist will help. And as always, thanks for watching, and Moo Moo Math uploads a new math or science video every day. Please subscribe and share. Our world is Thank you for my resources. These are my resources, the Mumu Math and Science channel and the Ayurveda channel from YouTube.com. Thank you so much for my resources. And for the student activity, state what you have learned in this lesson in 5 to 10 sentences. Submit your output to our Google Classroom in two days. Thank you. I hope you can get helpful knowledge from this presentation. Good luck!